Hey guys, it's Cynthia and welcome back to my studio. In my last video, I talked a bit about using a limited palette as a way to sort of get over color phobia. And it got me inspired to dig deeper into that subject and kind of have some fun playing around with limited palettes myself. It's been a long time since I've changed up my colors, so today I'm going to do three different studies that explore three different ways to use limited color. And color is a pretty deep and intense subject, so I'm going to try to keep things pretty simple. And I'm also going to talk a little bit about why I personally enjoy working this way and share some thoughts on why you might choose to limit your color before starting a painting or illustration. So for this first study, I'm using something that's very close to the Zorn palette. Now, Anders Zorn's famous palette relied on just four colors. That's white, ochre, red, and black. And there's a lot of debate about what the actual pigments were that he used. Like some say his red was vermilion, some say it was cadmium. Uh, depending on which account you read, there might be a different white involved. But the general idea is that cooler colors like blue, this is a very warm palette overall, uh, the blues and cooler hues are substituted with neutral gray created by the black and the white, which looks cooler in relation to the very warm reds and yellow hues. So I'll put a good link to the Zorn palette down in the description box for those of you who want to look into it more. Now, some white and some black pigments that you can buy are very slightly warmer or cooler in temperature than others, but Thankfully, color is relative, and the basic structure is the same no matter which you use. So I'm using the closest approximation to the Zorn palette out of the tubes of paint that I already had in my studio. And those colors are titanium white, yellow ochre, cadmium red deep. This is probably different from what Zorn used, but it's still a warm opaque red, so it does the job. And ivory black. And I'll quickly mention that for each of my studies today, I'll be working on my usual 5 by 7 inch tinted gessoed hardboard panels. And for my medium, I'll be using the only thing on my palette which truly has no limits, otherwise known as liquid. My goal for this study is to use the palette in a really subtle way. Instead of using straight out of the tube reds and yellows, I'm essentially mixing those saturated colors with my black and white to create different temperatures of browns and grays. It's pretty close to monochrome without actually being monochromatic. I'm just using color as an accent, more or less, to define the warm side and the cooler side of the model's face, and get the warmest stuff in my shadows to let the highlights look cooler in comparison. So now, why would you choose this kind of palette when you're working on a piece? This kind of warm and cool gray method is actually one of my favorites to use in really moody pieces where I want to show that my subject is either going through a hard time or they're persevering when things are kind of bleak, which is a pretty common theme in my work. Um, and that extends to digital paintings too. Like here are a couple examples from my portfolio where I really leaned into a palette like this. But like I mentioned in my last video, you can also use a limited palette like this as a way to get comfortable introducing color into your work, especially if you're used to working in like graphite or charcoal or other purely grayscale media. By just only introducing the idea of warm versus cool, it can really simplify that transition. And now if your ultimate goal in painting is to imitate nature as closely as possible, like some academic painters do, this palette is not going to get you there. And exactly lifelike isn't a result that you should expect to come out of this because color in nature is extremely nuanced. There are all kinds of little subtle temperature shifts that happen all over the place in natural light. But I think that not having that result be possible might be my favorite thing about limited palettes. Uh, to use linguistics as an analogy, they kind of force you to be an interpreter rather than a transliterator. And no matter what your goal is, it's a really good way to get yourself out of a color perfectionist mindset and focus on simplifying your paintings, even if you've been painting with a broader palette for a really long time. 
For the second study, I'm going to take one of those four colors away. I'm going to remove the yellow ochre from my palette, so now I'm just working with titanium white, ivory black, and cadmium red deep. And I'm going to get more saturated with it this time and use that red as a single dominant color, painting a girl wearing a bright red cloak. So again, if you're making an illustration or something more complex than a study like this, why would you choose to use a single dominant color rather than a wide range of color? So one reason might be that it's dramatic. You know, you want to make a splashy image and bold color is one of the easiest ways to attract a viewer's attention. It's like a bee to a flower. But in a narrative piece, it's also one of the simplest ways to create relationships between multiple subjects or between characters and their environment. For example, when we're watching a sporting event, team colors are how you identify who's playing on which side, right? Even from a, a huge distance away in the nosebleed seats, you can still look at a playing field and tell which team is which based on their jersey color. So if you think of the subjects of your illustration as a team or teams, you can assign the same color to any subjects that are related it's sometimes known as color keying or coding. And to use a film example, you might have noticed in M. Night Shyamalan's The Sixth Sense, the color red was used in a dominant way anytime there was about to be an interaction with the dead or with the other world. Since this piece is a simple study, I'm not expecting it to have a major story or narrative impact, but my goal here is to let the red cloak be special. It's the only thing in the piece that'll be super saturated, and I'm letting the strong pigment of the cadmium red do the work to give the illusion of being bright where that's getting hit by the light source. And I'm not tinting it with any white. Remember that white isn't always the answer to creating the illusion of light in a piece. Sometimes it's just about saturation. But I still want the focus to be on the woman using the values. And I will rely on white there to make her the actual brightest thing in my value structure. So for those of you who are new to painting, when I use the term value, I mean how dark or light something is. And a value structure is essentially talking about how the image would break down in grayscale from light to dark in the absence of any color. Because I want the cloak to be unique and stand out, the other thing that I want to do with this piece is to give my bold saturated red some neutral ground to be remarkable against. Like it wouldn't necessarily be wrong to mix red into the background, but it would create a different relationship between the character and the background. So to extend the sports metaphor, the character and the environment would be on the same team color wise. It's just one of those little tools that you can think about using the next time you're planning a narrative image. Now, in the context of the original viewer's question that inspired this video, that viewer was concerned about color kind of confusing their values. And that's a legitimate concern because when you introduce a wide range of color into your work, you're not only playing with value, but also with hue and saturation. And it's easy to get confused by what the native value of a color is at first. Understanding how hue, saturation, and value play together, it's a pretty complex topic, and if you get into the nitty-gritty of the science behind color theory, it can take decades to really internalize it all in a meaningful way. But in the interest of keeping this simple, this is one of those places where I find digital tools to be so helpful for understanding, because digital art programs provide us with a linear model of the HSV, or hue, saturation, and value sliders in a color palette. Here's an example of a color picker from Photoshop that I blew up from a screenshot, and it replicates the color palette from this painting study that I'm using. And you can clearly see the different ranges here. The value, that's how light or dark something is, goes from top to bottom. And then the saturation goes from left to right. And that little rainbow over to the right is the hue slider, which is a word that we often use interchangeably with color. The neat thing about the limited palette that I'm using here is that we can just outright ignore the hue slider, because red is our only option. 
So what you're seeing on screen is the entire range of what I have to work with to build this painting. And the really cool trick that you can do in a digital art program to quickly check your value structure is to turn your image to grayscale. And now if we do that with the color picker here, you can see that that brightest, most saturated red up in the corner is actually closer in value to a mid-tone than it is to white. But the saturation tricks our eyes into seeing it as a lighter value than it actually is. And if you wanted to do the same thing with your work, all you need to do is take a snapshot of your painting or take your file if you're already painting digitally and do the same thing, just convert it to grayscale. And that way you can see exactly what your lights and darks are doing without the color. Ultimately, you still want your piece to be readable either way. So let's do that here. Let's take a look at how this painting breaks down when it's converted to grayscale. Now, if you were here with me in the room, I'd take a show of hands, but even after looking at the color picker and how it translated into grayscale, how many of you thought the hood of the cloak was going to be a lighter value than the background? Probably at least a few of you did, but no, they only appear different because of the saturation. But the values are super close, which is why in either context, the woman still stands out as the focus. For the third study, let's limit ourselves even more. This is like the gold saucer arena battle in Final Fantasy VII where Cloud loses an ability each round, so we'll call this the final battle. We're gonna ditch the red now and just use black and white. Forget about color altogether, it is dead to us. And that's one of the fun things about making images is that color is actually optional. You can make a super impactful image without any color at all. Now, I don't know a lot of painters who work exclusively in black and white, but the extremely limited palette might be a good place to start if you've been working in graphite for a long time and are just starting to use paint just to get the feel of it. Because if you already know how to make a picture in grayscale, you're just introducing the feel of handling a new medium, like getting used to the opacity and the flow of wet media without color being an additional variable. Now, speaking of opacity, because ivory black is a semi-transparent paint, that's the other thing we can play with here. And I'm gonna try to keep my darkest shadows a little less opaque by using a lot of medium in them and not letting any white get into those areas. It's a way to give your shadows a little more life. And you can even kind of cheat this palette a little bit by toning your board with something other than gray. I didn't plan ahead far enough to do that here, but imagine what it would look like if the more transparent areas were letting a bold color show through. It would really change the look of the piece. All of these different methods that I've been showing you take time and practice, and especially if you're new to painting, don't expect it to be perfect at first, but hopefully this has given you a little insight into some alternatives to traditional palettes and how you can still make a rich and impactful image even with just a few tubes of paint. So for those of you who watch my channel regularly, you probably noticed this video was a little late. And just to put it out there, that was not intentional. I had a different video in the works and things just didn't go to plan. I recently bought a new computer and I was trying out some different screen recording software with a digital painting. Long story short, it crashed and I lost a pretty significant portion of the recording. So I'll have to either write that off as a loss or take a mulligan and try for that video again another time. I also have not been lazy lately. I've been working on a couple illustration jobs in the evenings on the side, and uh, I had a sketch deadline this past week for a Dungeons & Dragons book cover. Now, if you want to talk about unlimited palettes and ways that I don't normally use color, that would definitely be it. But beyond that, I can't really give any specific details about the cover until it's public. Release date TBD, but I'll try to share that with you guys as soon as it's out. When I said my New Year's goal was simplifying my life, I don't know who I was kidding. I might actually be doomed to being a chaos engine for the rest of my life. Uh, anyway, I'm gonna wrap this up for today, but before I go, I wanna tell you a quick story that relates to the topic today. I had an art teacher a couple decades ago who told me that when she was in school, she became known for painting only with earth tones. 
Her work was heavily influenced by the arts and crafts of the indigenous peoples of Mexico and the American Southwest. So popular opinion was that her palette was an intentional connection to her influences, but it turns out that because those pigments were the least expensive, they were the only ones she could afford in college. And the takeaway for me hearing her tell that story is that sometimes our limitations can become our strengths. So thanks for watching, guys. I'm going to go grab another cup of coffee and go work on some of my illustration homework. And I will see you guys next time. Bye-bye.